HR issues can kill you. One complaint against your company can turn your world upside down. And you spend way too much time dealing with HR when you should be spending your time on making a profit. You should talk to Bambi. With Bambi, get access to your own dedicated U.S.-based HR manager starting at just $99 per month. They get to know you and your business while providing HR expertise and the personal touch you need and want. They're available by phone, email, and real-time chat, so onboarding and terminations run smoothly. Team members reach peak performance, and your business stays compliant with changing HR regulations. And with Bambi's HR Autopilot, you'll automate important HR practices like setting policies, training, and feedback. HR managers can easily cost eighty grand a year, but Bambi starts at $99 per month. Schedule your free conversation today to see how much Bambi can take off your plate. Go to Bambi.com right now and type in Accelerate under podcast when you sign up. It'll really help the show. Spelled BAM, B-E-E dot com. Bambi.com. Type in Accelerate. Blog Talk Radio. Welcome to Accelerate Your Business Growth with your host, Diane Helbig. This show is designed to help small business owners, salespeople, and aspiring entrepreneurs master every aspect of business success. We've got a great lineup of guests and topics scheduled for you. We'll be talking about everything from sales to employee issues, from technology to social media, from work-life balance to exploring uncharted territory. Participation is welcome and encouraged. Your host, Diane Helbig, is a world-class author, speaker, and business development coach. Be sure to check out her latest book, Lemonade Stand Selling, on Amazon.com or BarnesandNoble.com. And now, on with the show. Well, good afternoon, good morning, good evening, wherever you are today. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, as we said, we welcome your input, so feel free to join the chat online, or if you're on the phone, press 1 to let me know you'd like to say something. Today's show is sponsored by Win Cleveland and Vision 21. Win Cleveland is an organization that empowers female professionals by creating new access points for individual business development. They support one another by providing continual professional growth, sharing a wide variety of ideas and resources, and assisting select women-based charities within their community. Visit www.wincleveland.org for more information. Vision 21 was created to assist established and aspiring entrepreneurs to successfully launch and grow small business enterprises throughout greater Cleveland. You can visit www.vision21.org for details, and that's Vision 21 spelled out. My guest today is Barbara Weaver-Smith. Barbara is founder and president of The Whale Hunters, a strategic sales coaching company that helps small and mid-sized businesses expand their businesses and grow by making bigger sales to bigger customers. Barbara is co-author of Whale Hunting, How to Land Big Sales and Transform Your Company, and writes the blog and newsletter, Whale Hunters Wisdom. Dr. Smith is an influential business leader and advisor and a respected keynote speaker at events throughout the country. A wide offering of her work and valuable information for small to mid-sized businesses can be found on her website at www.thewhalehunters.com. Welcome to the show, Barbara. Thank you, Diane. It's my pleasure to be here today. I am so thrilled that you're going to be with us, and I know you have so uh, much knowledge in this area. And this is such, you know, this key account management and, you know, keeping current employees is such, excuse me, key, keeping current clients is such yeah. a big issue uh, for and for anybody, you know, small, big, it doesn't really matter. But right. I'm really excited that we're going to be talking about it. I am um, too. I know you are. Um, I want to start with a problem that you've written about and I know you've talked about for a long time, which is um, the problem of the operations team struggling to deliver on whatever whatever the sales team has sold. Uh, you've described it as a key issue in a company's growth. i got to tell you, I could not agree more having been in sales in a previous existence. Uh, it, it is absolutely uh, a 
very interesting um, topic, and I think one that probably my audience has struggled with, uh, either uh, you know a little bit or a lot. Um, can you expand on that and share some of what your thoughts are on that subject? Absolutely, and I suspect that quite a few listeners are are rolling their eyes or having a giggle over that because uh, <laughs> it's it's a very common issue in small companies as they grow. L- let me just give an example of of how this was happening in a software company that I worked with. Oh, great! They they were a company that was quite a few years old, not a brand new company, but still in still in this small company mid-sized company size, I guess, and they had they had created um, several new uh, versions of their software. And what the development people had created was was a kind of a standard software that had a number of features that could be customized. And what the operations team was expecting to install was a standard product that you know, sometime down the road, maybe they would customize it. But what the sales team was selling was all the bells and whistles and what you could do with it. And so they they created, inadvertently, they created a huge gap between their customers' expectations and what they were capable of um, delivering. So it, it became a... a big, big problem for them. Yeah. It made their customers mad and disappointed, and it cost them a lot of money and got them in a lot of trouble. Uh, so anytime you have a, a distinction between custom and standard, whether it's a product or a professional service, you need to be sure that, that your team are all on the same page about what it is you're selling. Selling something in a box or you're selling a custom implementation. Yeah, and, and it's interesting. I mean, there really needs to be that um, clarity and that specificity so that everyone's talking the same language. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. So, um can you talk a little bit? I mean, I, I think sometimes we tend to go along this, well, it's obvious what the problem with that is, but can you talk a little bit about, you know, from the client's point of view, how that ends up being, you know, they, they end up being um, disappointed. You, you said, you know, the client's disappointed and they're not happy. Can you share some of, you know, from the client's point of view, what they go through? I think, you know, if the listeners can hear sort of the other side of the table, it, it, it may help them understand why this is a bigger problem than they may think and a little harder to fix. Sure. Well, the, the, the buyers are mad. They're mad at you. Um, they're very disappointed. When, yeah. when you have your first real contact with them after the sale and your team and their team start talking together about how this is going to be implemented, they believe that they've been sold a bill of goods yeah. and that the operations people are mad. You know, we had at the Whale Hunters, we had an example of being on the receiving end of that uh, last summer. We uh, we purchased a software integration package for our new website and uh, the very first uh, implementation call that we had with this company's implementation team when we were talking about when they were talking about what they were going to provide for us it didn't match up with what we thought we had bought and when we talked to them about well what about this and what about that they literally said on this first call well they shouldn't have promised you that we can't Ooh. do that we don't do that and so they were embarrassed yeah. And they were angry at their sales team. And on my side, we were we were mad because yep. we had already paid for something different. So I think it's a huge issue, Diane. And um, I'm not sure that uh, everybody who's in charge of the company uh, necessarily understands how easy it is for this to happen because it's not – it's not – doesn't derive from ill will or from right. lack of caring. It just can happen so easily, and you just don't realize it. So, what are some things that that the leadership can do 
to try and avoid this kind of thing or, you know, improve the relationship between sales and operations? Yeah. Um, you know, as the leader, I think uh, <clears throat> there are several things. Uh, first of all, you need to make sure that, that you are in charge of making it happen. You can't expect your salespeople and your operations people to make this happen by themselves. They live in different arenas. Uh, they live in possibly in different silos. So I think you have to train for it. You need to hire people who are willing to collaborate. You need to promote understanding and you need to support it. So you need to be sure that they have the resources um, to spend some time together so that they can just get to know each other. Um, we do a lot of work with our customers in collaborative team settings, bringing people together, sales and operations with the leadership team to talk about these things, explore, you know, debrief on uh, some experiences that have been painful and work on some ways that that could be improved, um, clarify their understandings. Usually uh, the whole company is kind of a little or a lot miffed at the salespeople most of the time. They feel as if they have enough work. Thank you very much. Don't bring me any new ones this week. And salespeople think that everybody else doesn't get it the way they do. I mean, that, right. this is a fact of life. It's not that one side's right and the other side's wrong, but they can learn to understand each other's roles a lot better. And the more they understand uh, the better they work together, in my experience. Yeah, I, I think that's so true. It reminds me of um, the first company I worked at when I got out of college many moons ago. And at one point I went to the leadership and I said, you know, you need to have them stop selling and you need to bring <laughs> right. them in. You know what I mean? They, everyone needs to stop and we need to bring them yeah. in to the factory so that we can show them exactly what it is we do and that we make. So yeah. when they go out, they're not, you know, saying we're doing things there's no way we're ever doing. Right. And they looked at me like I was nuts, but it really, it, and it created so many problems internally. That was my yeah. problem. You know, it wasn't that externally right. the impact it was having on the client base. Because my problem was what was going on inside the company. But um, I, 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 it, it's so interesting what, you know, the first thing that you said was, you know, the leader has to understand that they're in charge. Right. It is an interesting concept. I, you know, I think sometimes they think, well, we I hired people to have those conversations. Well, yeah, you did, but are they having them? You exactly. know, are they connected? I mean, that's really true. My whole philosophy of of small business is that management needs to, they need to be in charge. There are certain yeah. things that you can't hand off. You can hand off specific roles, but you can't hand off collaboration. It just won't happen. And the bigger you get and the faster you grow and the, the busier the people get, that's what suffers. It's not from lack of caring or lack of ill will. They just have their own jobs, and part of their job description doesn't typically include getting to know what everybody else is up to. Right. So I think it's a huge leadership issue, and you, you nailed the question, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, isn't that interesting? So, um, well, so let me ask, this is sort of a weird question. Do you think that the leadership really understands the impact that these kinds of things has on the client or the prospect? You, you know, I mean, I you know, I, 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 yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. I, I don't you, think they necessarily do understand yeah. unless they get in deep trouble with the client. If, yeah. if you've gone out after a much bigger client, uh, you know, if you're trying to move your company up a level to uh, customers that are bigger, more sophisticated, uh, you can get in very, very serious trouble. Uh, over this issue with people who will take you to court, you know, people who will threaten you, people who will demand uh, payment. Um, yeah. I have I have seen people get in, in huge trouble that they didn't intend to bring on and really blindsided them. So I, th I think it's a very important thing for 
for the leadership team to be thinking about and make sure that you have a really good fit between what your salespeople are selling and what everybody yeah. else thinks they're delivering. <laughs> yeah, it's 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 crazy. And and the other side of that is that even if even if it's on a smaller scale, those clients are talking to other people. Oh so yeah, the bad absolutely. word of mouth. Yeah, I mean it's it's yeah. just wow. So, um, do you? Do, I mean, it, you know, it's one thing when you're, you know, a solopreneur. You're very small. It's you and maybe three other people, and so you're so ingrained in the business that you're participating in everything anyway. Mm-hmm. Do, do you see this happening when you know people make the shift to growth? You know, yes. when they start growing yes. bigger and they lose sight of it? Yeah, when they, they they kind of begin, I mean, companies start as entrepreneurial companies with, you know, it's a solopreneur or it's a small team and it's a skunk works or you're doing it out of the garage and everybody right. knows everything and everybody's helping with everything. And so, you know, you can manage it a little better, although you're probably pretty short on process, which brings you different kinds of issues. But but as as you grow, you know, if you're successful enough to grow, then you begin to differentiate your roles. And as soon as you do that, um, these these issues are right around the corner. And unless you know to think about them and plan for them, they can really catch you unawares. And I would say, you know, in my experience working with small and mid-sized businesses, that I've I've never encountered a company that hasn't uh, experience some level of this problem. <laughs> right. Yeah, I'll bet. It, it's, it's very predictable. So if you have the problem, it's not that you're doing things wrong. It's a it's a predictable phase in your growth, but you have to fix it. So what's great about it is that if it's predictable, I mean, so, so one of the warning shots that we're sending out today to, to any of the listeners who are small and growing is, you know, as you grow, keep an eye out. You know, be Absolutely. aware. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. yeah. Yeah. So that you're, I mean, from my perspective, it means continually rebuilding a collaborative culture yeah. kind of over and over again as you get bigger and as your roles get more differentiated because it won't happen automatically. Yeah. So so it's it it is a continual process. It's, you know, that an organization is a living thing, and as it grows, it needs to be reminded of certain certain key elements to their success. Oh, that's so true, Diane. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. interesting. I agree with you. Now, you said something a second ago about um, that, that, you know, smaller companies are short on process, which can lead to other sorts of problems. Are they the kinds of problems that can impact their relationships with their clients? Yes. Yes, I mean, here here's an example. Um, the company may or may not have um, a detailed or written down sales process, but they have a method by which they go about uh, dealing with sales. And then typically on the operations side, they are more process oriented, and so they have a process of some kind that they use to... Um, you know, provide the products and services to the customers. Right. But I have encountered very few companies that already had a very explicit process of how they get from the sales process to the operations process. Oh, that's that's interesting. And that's where their troubles happen when they, you know, you you make the sale and the sales team celebrates it and they throw it over the transom to operations and they all go to work. But, uh, you know, there's probably not anything written down that says specifically what happens next. And particularly, there's not typically something written down that says how do we communicate our next steps with the customer. So you can get in huge trouble just 
wow. right from the beginning. I mean, this used to happen to me when I, you know, when I was new in my business and I was really doing a consulting service, I would make the sale and then our team would get, you know, we would get really cranked up and doing all this work to prepare to deliver the service, but we didn't tell the customer what we're doing. You know, we had maybe a date set three or four weeks from now that we're supposed to do something for you, a big event or something, but it didn't occur to us that they might need to understand daily or weekly, you know, what have we accomplished on your behalf. This right. Week. A, lot of, a lot of this, Diane, I learned from painful experience of <laughs> not doing it very well. It's not, didn't just dream it up. <laughs> right, right. Didn't come out of nowhere. It's funny because you're talking about that, and I'm remembering an experience I had with someone who was doing a website for me, and he had mm-hmm. said, you know, this is how long it's going to take, and, you know, it should be. But then I didn't hear right. from him. So I'm emailing him going, yeah. okay, uh, are we moving forward with this? So, you know, I've given you my deposit. And he's like, well, yeah, of course we're moving forward. But he knew mm-hmm. it wasn't going to be until, you know, we weren't going to start until a certain date. I didn't know that. Right. So, yeah. yeah, I hear exactly yeah, what you're so saying. It's, now, in it's your book. It's really not complicated, but it's No, really it's weird. not. That's a very good point. But, you know, the easy stuff oftentimes we miss. Um, right. In your book, uh, you write about, you know, making and keeping promises as, you know, an early way to establish that relationship of trust with a new co- uh, customer. I'm thinking this is part right. of that. Can you elaborate on that and tell us more about it? Sure. And I think, you know, it's <clears throat> you can't just rely only on your long-term big promises. Take your example of the website. You know, you you commissioned a website designer and they promised that by such and such a time you'd have a website and probably they delivered on that, certainly they intended to, but time is going by and you're not getting any updates. So you're getting nervous. Right. Even though everything's going along fine, the piece that's missing is they're not you know, actively reminding you that er- that they're there and everything's going along fine. So yeah. I don't think it's good to rely only on the long-term big promise. I think you should make a plan to do small promises and do them frequently and have a system to ensure that you keep your promises. Like I might, if I were, if I were, um, you know, engage to build your website, I might say, Diane, um, every week by noon on Friday in your inbox will be an update of what we've accomplished this week right? and a link to what you can look at. And so the most important thing is that whatever they promise, whatever you promise, you do it exactly the way you promise. Yeah. Or I will call you the day after tomorrow at 4 o'clock to tell you what happens next. So they don't have to be big promises and they don't have to be hard. Just small things with much greater frequency and have some kind of a reminder system for yourself so that you don't forget them. When you, uh, there's, there's a, there's a theory about promises that if, if you fail to keep a promise, you kind of have to keep make and keep three more before you regain that level of trust. Huh. So I like the I like the notion of making small promises that are easy to keep and putting very clear date and time deadlines on them so that the person that you've made the promise to understands that you're keeping it. And then I think if if you have a team of people that are working on a project then Many of them can be involved in making and keeping promises, but the team leadership needs to have that under control. So they're not making promises for other people that those people don't know about or can't keep. (laughs) (laughs) You know, you need to make promises for yourself. I will call you before noon on Friday. Right. And then, so if I call you before noon on Friday... Uh, you're pleased. You expected it, but you're pleased that I did. And if I don't, then I've set up an expectation that annoys you. 
Right. And it leads, if I can't keep small promises, it undermines your faith in my ability to keep bigger promises. Exactly. Uh, and you know what's interesting for me is that I think sometimes um, people are under the impression that the other person is going to be understanding. So right. like, you don't mm-hmm. keep the promise and then you call and you explain, you know, what mm-hmm. went on in your life that got in the way that the other person's mm-hmm. going to be understanding. It's not necessarily true, especially mm-hmm. early on in a business relationship. Yeah, exactly. And even even if they do understand it just it puts you in jeopardy yeah. because yeah. you said you were going to do something and you didn't. So yeah, uh, you know I I think you should you should be very wary of promising stuff that you're not sure you can deliver. And in, you know instead of doing that, just promise little things and do them. And if so, you know if something comes up in your life, get somebody else to make that phone call for you. you right. Know, send them an email. Right. And say, you know I promise to do X Y Z. Tell them ahead of time. You know what's happening and it's really hard to do it um after the fact you just you damage a relationship whether you realize it or not yeah yeah exactly it's a really good point uh i do want to uh remind all of our listeners that today's show is sponsored by win cleveland and vision 21 you can visit www.wincleveland.org to learn more about the networking opportunities for women in Northeast Ohio and www.vision21.org for details on how you can utilize the resources of Vision 21 to grow your business. And if you would like to participate in the conversation today, if you're in the chat room, please write something into the chat room and I will read it out loud to Barbara and we'll get her input. If you're on the phone, you can press 1 and that will let me know that you have something you'd like to say and I will unmute you and you can share. Okay, so um, I'm wondering, uh, I have this question, you know, about some examples that you've encountered of companies, you know, that have inadvertently damaged their trust relationship with their customers and you've shared, uh, you know, some personal experiences do you have other examples of uh, ways in which, you know, maybe that are sort of different of ways in which companies uh, that you're aware of have, you know, done things that they didn't even realize were putting them in jeopardy? Oh, yes. I have quite a, quite a few common <laughs> examples, not from particular companies, but things that happen all the time. I've, Great. They, and I like to talk about how can a group of trustworthy people behave like a trustworthy team. Because I believe that most people are trustworthy and want to be trustworthy, but sometimes they shoot their company in the foot uh, without even meaning to. So the first thing that could happen is when, when your salesperson has closed the deal, they're celebrating with the customer, They've they've got the sale and it's about to be taken over by the internal operations delivery team. The salesperson says, "Now, you know that that I am your friend and your ally. So if they don't take good care of you, you just call me, and I'll make sure that they do." So the salesperson is trying to continue to build a relationship and ingratiate themselves in with the client, but they've just planted a seed of mistrust (laughs) that the people who are taking over the project might not be as reliable as the salesperson is. So this happens very, very, very often, unfortunately. Your customer calls in to the help desk. Here's this example comes straight out of uh, it's a great software technology example. A lot of your listeners are undoubtedly in, in those fields. Yeah. Somebody calls into the help desk, and the person on the help desk says, "Well, you know that's really not a help desk issue. That's really a development issue or an R and D issue, and you know how hard it is to work with them." <laughs> so everybody's covering their own AWQ and trying to be friendly with the customer, but they're 
they're slamming somebody else. Or yeah. uh, you call your account manager and you want to know when uh, you can get your training scheduled. And the account manager said, "Well, I'll you know I'll look into it, but I hear that training is a few weeks behind." <laughs> or the receptionist fails to pass along a message, yeah. or um, you know reports that you're on vacation for a week and and doesn't offer the customer another option of who to talk to. So uh, there are many, many examples of how your trustworthy people are inadvertently damaging trust with your customers, uh, in part just out of trying to build a friendship relationship. Right. You know, right. trying to be buddies yeah. or something. Right. And if if people don't, if you don't bring this to their attention and work on it with your team, you'll never know it's happening, and they won't even know it's happening. It can be just totally under the radar in your company. It's so interesting. It's so because they really they don't realize they're doing it. Because you're right, they think that they're commiserating. With the exactly. Customer. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Yep. That's a great word. Yep. I'm going to use that one. <laughs> Go do absolutely. It's funny because I feel like you know you're you're saying those, and I'm laughing because I'm thinking about experiences that I've had, where you know someone who works in an organization will confide in me, and I'm thinking, don't do that. I'm the client. Right. You know, I don't want you. Exactly. You know, I'm not your bud. So yep. yeah, yeah, it's interesting. That's so now. True. Um, mm-hmm. Okay, so how does how can they become um, aware? Do, do you know what I mean? I mean, how how does yeah. what what does leadership do to help them think before they open their mouth? I guess. Yeah. Well, I think that that's a great question. I think that leadership needs to understand that this is a common problem, first of all. Okay. And so even if you don't see it in your company or you don't think you have it, um, you ought to try to unearth whether you do. And the way that I always recommend doing that is bringing people together and, and – um, you know, have a conversation or a workshop or, or a, you know, a plan to explore this particular issue, and uh, you need to do it deliberately. You know, if you have a, if you have a brown bag lunch or a, you know, a, a time when you bring people together to talk about stuff, put it on your agenda and yeah. ask people to talk about it. If if you're having issues with current customers or past Customers, it's the kind of thing that can really come out if you do a good debriefing. And you know, a lot of small companies don't have a process for debriefing or doing a post mortem. Uh, you know, whether it was a successful or less than successful project, they're they're busy all the time. Everybody's right. busy, and they're moving on to the next thing. So. I think these are leadership issues, and uh, the more deliberate you can be about, you know, understanding that there's always a potential that your internal team is unintentionally, um, you know, deflecting the trust that your customers have in you, especially at the beginning of an engagement. So uh, bring it up, ask people about it, you know, have some fun with it because, as you know, when I tell these stories, they are funny stories. You've been yeah. there. It's hard to them yourself, but you just don't want your team to be doing them because then they're less funny. Well, and I think if, if they make it um, – I love that debrief idea. You know, if you make it part of the process mm-hmm. and you're consistent with it, then – Everyone's everyone gets it, you know. It becomes part of the environment, and so maybe they're more conscious of how they're interacting. I mean, maybe just having consistency Absolutely. there. Absolutely, I think, I think yeah. they are. Yeah, yeah. So they're, um, you know, I think that every everyone in the company 
needs to be very respectful of everyone else and every other division in public. And whatever issues you have, you need to deal with those in private. You know, you know, even if you um, really believe that customer yeah. service sucks, you, yeah. you just need to deal with that inside and not in front of your customers. Right. Right. It's funny. I remember um, working for a company where there were different departments, and we would have these what they called customer service meetings, which was everybody mm-hmm. who touched the customers, you know, had to come mm-hmm. to these meetings where you learned about what what the challenges and opportunities were in the other departments. Because mm-hmm. we really have no idea, right? We go about our business, we do our thing, we, we you know, we figure management's taking care of the connecting. But it's nice exactly. to hear, yep. you know, from people mm-hmm. on the front line what's going on in your world, and you get this interesting, you know, understanding of, the, you know, the customer service or the delivery people or the production mm-hmm line and you know yeah yeah it's that communication that, and you that, can that. certainly if, if if you think if you think you have an issue or you think you have a you know particular customer where you didn't handle things well you know talk to them go ask them well, you know can i take right. you to lunch and, um would you would you help me understand this because whatever happened it wasn't our intent we know it you know it our intent it didn't really matter to you because you experienced the outcome of it, but it does matter to us, and we don't want to make this mistake again. So, right, you know, would you be willing to help us understand so we can fix it? And yeah, I, I have a number of clients who have done that very successfully. Their customers are very willing to do that, and they appreciate being asked. Exactly, and when they see that you're trying to solve a problem, that you're owning that there's a problem, and you're trying to solve it, right. Yeah, and that that can probably you know build some trust, and maybe you can get them back, you know, if you've sure. lost them. Yep. Yeah, interesting. So, um, we, it's funny because you know we started this conversation talking about uh, the salespeople selling something and the operations people having a completely different idea, and and there's a balance mm-hmm. there of right selling what you really can deliver. Um, you know, what's what's some input for people who who need to strike that balance? You know, what what can they do to make sure that they're staying on that right course? Sure, if there there's um, yeah, you know, there are two kind of ways to answer that. One is um, you know, to to work on work on the handoff. Um, as I said. In, that uh, there, there's very seldom a really good plan of how sales hands off to operations, yeah, yeah. and there's very, very seldom a plan that's shared with the customer. So oh. it would be helpful for them to know what to expect. And if if they don't, you run the risk of scaring them and disappointing them, and it's harder to get paid and you lose your margin on the sale. I mean, there's a lot of really right. scary things that can happen. The other, the other thing is um as you grow, and this is a this is a problem for every company that intends to grow, they have to strike a balance between selling and delivering. And most of the time uh as a growth strategy, you try to exceed your current capabilities in your sale, and that's how you get the money to develop mm-hmm. the rest of the capabilities you need. So, there, again, there's nothing unusual about that. There's nothing wrong with it. It's how it works, especially if you don't have a constant influx of capital. So from the standpoint of, you know, my business, whale hunting, we believe that people should do that carefully and deliberately. And... um have a strategy for how you're going to manage it. Uh, that um, part part of it is um, invest invest what you can afford. Move as fast as you can through the sale, but then get one new big one under your belt before you do another one. Don't bring in three brand new ones all at the same time. <laughs> and do them one at a time. Um, the, another thing that that is really important, I believe, is to be 
very transparent internally and do your best to allocate the resources fairly to your team. If you bring in a new big deal, the people who need to do the work for you, they, they need to believe that you're going to see they have the resources, that they're not going to suddenly have a job that's twice as hard or takes twice as long to do. Yeah. That if, if you're bringing in a new big piece of work and you're making money on it as a company, that some of that money is going to balance the workload fairly. So that requires a lot of internal transparency. People will, your team will put up with a lot of angst over the short term in order to bring in these new big deals. If they have confidence in your leadership that over the long term you're going to be fair. That's a great but point. But if they don't if they don't believe that your company is fair and truly the bigger the company, the less people really tend to believe they're yeah. fair. Uh and, and they get so disillusioned, that's why they, you know, say, Stop bringing in more work, we don't have time do it and that's the kiss of death on growth um i think you need to have good contingency plans you need to work with your banker or lending agency or investor or whatever um you know are you are you going to have the resources you need to ramp up to do this deal and those decisions need to be made uh during the sales process not after right and, and right. always, I mean, I'm a huge believer in debriefing and learning at every step. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, because it is a growth process. You know, it's it's you're going to be yes. experiencing yeah. things you've never experienced before. That's right. And every, you know, when you think about it, every company that ever grew to be big, um, you know, most of them started out small. Or right. as a conglomerate of smaller organizations, and these these are very very predictable expectations that are that are signs of growth. There's nothing wrong with them. It's it's all about how you um, anticipate and manage them. I think it's just truly about leadership and management of a collaborative team. I'm a huge believer in collaboration. People need to know what's going on as broadly as possible. And that's what you lose when you move out of the um, entrepreneurial mode into more, you know, uh, process-oriented um, mode of right. operation with distinct roles and responsibilities. There, there's a there's a very great risk of losing a lot in that process. Yeah, yeah I, I, I agree completely. I think it's such a you know great points about uh one of the things i love that you that you've said a couple of times and i'm so glad that you're saying it and reinforcing it is that this is it, it's not unusual that these things go on because so many business owners think that these things are only happening in their company and somehow you know they're failing when everyone else is succeeding but these are the kinds of things that go on all over the place oh yeah that that's that's just entirely true, and I don't know that it necessarily makes people feel better, but it, it, it is true that you can't grow your business without some of these things happening. So, yeah. um, you know, I don't think they kind of teach it in, in the business school. I think it's yeah, I more of a, a school of hard knocks where you learn this kind of stuff. And uh, entrepreneurs, founders, CEOs of growing companies, uh, we have we have a lot on our plate all the time. And it's hard to carve out this planning time and this collaborative time. Uh, yeah. But I, personally, I believe it's critically important um, that you do whatever you can to um, – Keep your whole team apprised of what's going on in all of the areas of your business all of the time with the focus on how are you um, treating your customers. Right. You know, on Valentine's Day, you, you tweeted a couple things about this interview, you know, that was about love your customers, and it is. <laughs> you know. Just seems how, to say, how it is about loving your customers. It's it's absolutely and how true. Do, 
how do they recognize that you're right. loving them? You can't right. just say we love them, but do they, do they feel the love? I think right. a lot of yeah. them. Yeah, oh, that would have been better. You're, you're absolutely right. Are they feeling the love? It's it's absolutely key to this. Um, and and what's interesting is I think, you know, you said something about, you know, that they're they're growing and they've got so much going on they don't feel like they necessarily have the time. But if you flip that around, do you have the time – to clean up the mess afterwards and then have to replace that client with another one because they're gone. Oh, yeah. I mean, that, that's absolutely the the only way to look at it. Yeah. Um, it, it takes you so long to recover. It takes you a very long time to recover trust. Even if you retain the client, it takes right. you a much longer time to recover trust in the industry if you really mess up, and the bigger the client you're messing up with, the bigger problem you have exactly. because they have more reach than you. I mean, even even a, a you know even a small customer. I don't mean to necessarily privilege a bigger or customer, but whale hunting is all about growing by doing bigger deals, right? And looking at customers that are bigger than you. So you're from that standpoint, you're always at risk because they have the resources of bigger. <laughs> right. And so uh, you need to work doubly, triply hard. The other thing is that when big companies choose to do business with small companies, which sometimes is hard for them to do internally to make that decision, when they choose to do business with a smaller company, they do it because they want the best of what small companies deliver and that's personal attention, right. high quality service. Um, they get the feeling that they're in control, you know, that you're not too busy to um, pay close attention to them. So they expect more from you than they expect from another big company that's like them. And so as soon as they don't get it, they, they're very disappointed. That they made That's a the really good point. You, and they're very worried that they can get in big trouble for going out of their comfort zone and, and booking a contract with an unknown or lesser known or smaller company. Yeah. They're very afraid of making that kind of mistake. So if they've taken the risk to do it, you just have to. I mean, over-deliver is an overused term, but you really right. do need to give them at least everything that they expected, even though it's not all in your contract. <laughs> right. Right. Well, that's so great. I mean, I think that's invaluable for people to really look at what what do people expect, you know, when they bring you in. And I think what a great point about they want all of what's best about being a small company. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes right. what people do is they go, well, we're playing with the big boys now. We have to act like the big boys. Well, that's not necessarily how you got mm -hmm. there. So why you're exactly. there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. a great. Yeah, I, I never. Lot, thought a of lot that. of big companies have. They have their own internal problems because they're bureaucracies, and it's yep. hard for them to be innovative, and it's hard for them to get things done quickly, and it's hard for them to get personal attention to anything. So sometimes, even though they get very afraid of doing business with small companies, sometimes what they need. Only a small company can deliver, or they they really believe that what you can deliver is is so superior. Uh, they need it so much that they're willing to take a chance. But then you, you you realize that they've had to put aside a lot of fears in right. order to do that. We we do a lot of work, and it's in, it's in my book, and I have a webinar coming up on this. So why do why do you scare the whales and what can you do about it? And they're they're afraid of small companies. They're afraid that they're gonna crush you. They're afraid that you can't handle it. They're afraid you don't have enough money to ramp it up. They're afraid that you can't wait hundred and twenty days to get paid because that's what it's gonna take. Um they're afraid you you won't last long enough. Uh, they're afraid that uh, they'll be ridiculed by other people in the company who never heard of you. Uh, so they have a lot of fears. Wow. It's a big, it's a big 
uh, chasm to get them over those fears. And if they get over it, it's because they believe that you have, you're agile, you're facile, you're innovative, you can do stuff that they can't get internally, they can't get from other big companies. But they just have to have a lot of um, sense that they're getting that personal attention that they thought they bought. And so you, you have to be think, more like yourself and less like another big company. Right, right. So but that leads me to, it's funny because I have a client who's um, small and, you know, needs to be selling to big, you know, and will mm-hmm. say to me, um, I, I couldn't take everything, you know, that they would have. And I said, okay, but I'm not sure they're going to want to give you everything they have till you've been tested. Right. Right? Is that is that exactly. a fair... That it's oh, really okay absolutely. to say, you know, I don't want to take on everything, let's build, you know, let's start slowly. And right, yeah. Yeah, and then I, I, I definitely believe in that. Now, there, there's one caveat that I always say to that. Don't take work that's too small or too cheap yeah. just to get your foot in the door. Yeah. If, it, if it's a good contract for a reasonable amount of work that you can handle, absolutely do that. But don't don't cut your price. Yeah. Uh, don't cheapen it up just to get your foot in the door because they will pigeonhole you as the small, cheap people. Yeah, yeah, good point. And it's almost yeah. impossible to get out of that niche. <laughs> that's a great point. That, thank you for that. That's, that's absolutely mm-hmm. true. So... Okay, so um, we, you know, we have our clients and we're working with them and there comes, there, there's inevitably going to come a time where we should either be selling them more or renewing a contract or some combination of the two. Is, is there a timing issue, you, you know, involved with this? I mean, other than the contract's up, you know, what's yeah. your take I do. I, I I would say that's a, that's another um, that's another management issue. Um, it's a, it's very easy for the team that's delivering to be so focused on delivering the current business and putting out mm-hmm. fires and things that they're not necessarily thinking three months or six months ahead. So again, I think the management needs to review with their delivery teams, um, you know, progress and what's going on with the client on a very predictable, regular basis. So, um, you know, what are what are some times? If if your contract's going to be up, obviously you want to start thinking about that months before the contract is up. But there there are other times when you can propose. Um, new business with your current customers, you know, maybe they're giving you signals that they're interested in something or they're looking at something that you could do, but you haven't really talked to them about that. Or when you have new things going on in your company or additional knowledge or uh, offerings that you could bring to them that would add value that they don't know about. Uh, Another time is when you've delivered uh, a big portion of your current work to their great delight, um, and maybe there's another uh, department or division or area that um, would also benefit from the same thing you did. And, you know, I think when they're in pain and when they need help, particularly the people that you work with on a day-to-day basis, if if they're struggling with internal things that lots of them are, you know, you should bring your team together and figure out, is there anything we could do to help them? Not even necessarily thinking about it as a new sale, but it, right. could, could we help them? And, um, you know, that's a reason. It's always an opportunity to have a conversation. Okay, so so I have a question about that because sure, I... I I have a fear that some people are going to hear it and, and not hear the part about um, you have to have delivered on what you promised yeah, first. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, there, there's, it's my, I mean, correct me where I'm wrong, but I feel like, you know, th- there's a point before which you should not be going down that road. Oh, absolutely. 
it's, it's totally, totally true. I mean, we okay. we use the process at the Whale Hunters, a full day workshop that we take customer our clients through, in which they look at new business with three of their biggest accounts. And part of what we do is kind of map the history of that account. And often we see that an account starts out with a strong relationship and a strategic objective, but over time it becomes a more ordinary relationship and it gets more tactical. And that can happen just because you're doing what you promised. Yeah. And so, you know, the bloom is off the rose. You're you're an insider now and they've done that deal and they're vulnerable to bells and whistles from the outside. So you have a lot of work to do internally to manage those relationships such that they are truly delighted and that they understand why they ought to be delighted. <laughs> right. So that would almost so, be, so that's you know, a, sort of a pitfall of getting so involved in the process of doing what you said that you forget about the relationship nurturing aspect of Yeah. Yeah. Right? And again, that's why yes, exactly, Diane, and that's why I always say, you know, management needs to lead this. Right. Um, you know, you're the entrepreneur is not probably managing every account. And so the people who are running the account, managing the account, they're very busy doing that. Yeah. Um a lot of a lot of their counterparts inside a big account are asking for things, demanding things that are possibly not reasonable, last minute, they ask for a bunch of new ideas and then they don't act on them uh there's there's a lot of busy work that comes in to your team and they typically do their best to meet those demands but as a management team if you don't know that if you don't you know make it your business to know that your team right. is not going to necessarily complain about it they're just over time they're going to just not like this account and you can be a big loser. It's just, again, it's just so predictable. It's so predictable. It happens all the time. There's nothing, that is really interesting. There's nothing about this that should ever surprise you, I guess. That's <laughs> <laughs> and yet. Okay, but this, so now that leads me to another question, which is, and I, and I w- didn't really think I was going to ask this one, but um, for the smaller company, who should be responsible for selling new business to a, a key account? Should it be the people who originally sold it, or or the people who are working on it, or the I don't you know the entrepreneur? Who, who? Yeah, I, that's that's a terrific question, and I would say, you know, tongue in cheek, cheek, I would say all the above. <laughs> um, it needs to be directed by the management team. It needs to be directed by the senior management team. They need to find a methodology by which they can uh, bring together their account team and their sales team if they have one or if they are the sales team. They need to be sure that there's a group of people that fully understand what's going on in this account and what are the opportunities. And And when I say what are the opportunities, I mean a serious look at what are all the buying groups in this company who could buy something else from you? And what are all the products and services that you could offer? I mean, it's just like a, a table of matrix of who can buy besides people you're, you've already sold to and right. what can you sell in addition to or besides what you've already sold. I, I think of it as being very, very systematic and being done on a periodic basis. I mean, my recommendation is every six to nine months with every account. Take oh, the time to do it really systematically. Yeah. Otherwise, because it just then you won't happen. forget to do it. Exactly. And, and otherwise, your, your account team, they're so quote-unquote, in-country. They're so heads down trying to do yeah. the best job uh, for these people. They're so, uh, they understand all the internal problems that people are dealing with. And and if some of those are internal problems that affect individuals rather than the whole company, and some of those individuals aren't going to always be there. So you have to take that up a level 
as a management team, you have to take take that over. Uh, make it your job to understand what's going on because you you know you probably know more than your account team does just about you know business development right in general they're they're right. focused on serving a particular client and sometimes yeah. that clients and especially these days I mean people are serving a lot of clients that are really in pain uh, yeah. they have a lot of counterparts that are. You know, they're still faced with losing their job. They're still faced with downsizing. They're still faced with their budgets are being cut. They don't know what's going to happen next. And it, it's not a good environment for your account team to be responsible for new business decisions. They're going to just be head down and, um, you know, how can I get today's work right. done? Wow. Absolutely. This was so great. I can't believe we are almost uh, at time. Will you please share with our listeners um, how they can find you? I'll I'll write your um, website into the chat box. Will you please share with them, you know, things. You mentioned something about a a webinar that you have coming up that I I think would be outstanding. So how they can learn about it, you know, reach out to you. Great, thank you. Well, the, the easiest way to find us is to visit our website. It's thewhalehunters.com. And uh, on the home page of the website, there's a link to upcoming events. I mentioned the webinar on February 24th, which is about um, how small companies scare whales and what you can do about it. <laughs> we have... <laughs> A number of virtual events every month. Some are free and uh, some are for a fee. We also maintain uh, our online community. We call that Peer 9. You also get to that at thewhalehunters.com. It's a resource library for small business development, uh, all kinds of resources, new ones every day, and a list of all our events and products. Terrific. Thank you so much. Well, I, I once again, I want to thank uh, Barbara Weaver-Smith for being my guest today. And I'd like to thank all of you for taking time out of your day to join us. I am sure that you found the information as valuable as I did um, and, and thought-provoking. I mean, really, some things to think about and consider. Please visit our sponsors at uh, www.wincleveland.com and uh, vision21.org to learn more about them. Our next show will be on February 28th when my guest will be Terry Hickey, and he will be talking to us about our money and health beliefs and how to break through them toward greater success, so that should be fascinating. I don't want to miss that. You can mark the show as a favorite so you get the um, a notice of upcoming shows so you can be sure that you are there to listen. Uh, and as always, if you find yourself struggling with the sales process, please pick up a copy of Lemonade Stand Selling at barnesandnoble.com or amazon.com. Have a great week, and we will be chatting again on the 28th. Thanks, everybody. Hi, my name is Sara, and I want to tell you about my podcast called Can I Offer You Some Feedback? I'm a business consultant and executive coach with over 20 years experience in change management, leadership development, and naturally providing feedback to high performers. My podcast is for those of you who have a complicated relationship with feedback, whether giving, receiving, avoiding, or seeking. Feedback is essential for our development. In each episode, you'll hear from real people across industries with their ideas, perspectives, and best practices on feedback. I'll also be sharing business bites with you, simple explanations of organizational tools, management techniques, and leadership philosophies that will help you and your businesses thrive. You can listen to Can I Offer You Some Feedback on your favorite podcast app or learn more at evergreenpodcasts.com.